actually one minute, but in reality, three minutes. Perfect. There we go. Woot, woot. I think I might try a new backdrop for our next uh, deep dive live because these are just actually library books. <laughs> <laughs> has it always been the books? Um, for deep dive live, it has always been the books. And for the fireside chats, it is um, a fireplace with a chair, like a cozy nook in like a cottage situation. <laughs> so I am, uh, I see Kevin tapping his, tapping his finger. I wonder if we're live on YouTube. I don't see chats. We will find out. Oh, we have six viewers from somewhere. Can I tell where they're from? Mm, seven on YouTube. Facebook. Are you? Oh, great. Okay, cool. We just haven't seen the viewer count on YouTube flow through yet. Yeah, that's what people might not realize. If you're watching any of our live streams, there's also the team in the background monitoring everything. <laughs> yes, the literal people behind the curtain. Um, quite possibly also behind this curtain behind me. Yes. It takes a it takes a village. Is that yes. It takes a village or a team or a community. All right. Oh great. We're getting some people saying hello. Ah well yeah. Thanks Millicent. Great. The weather on Fantasy Island is stunning. Oh I remember talking about that from a few a few sessions ago where the Fantasy Island TV show um, was so, so popular. And now there's a Fantasy Island uh, movie, which was not terrible. It was good. Hey, TJ. Up to state, let's see, upstate South Carolina. Yeah, Giuseppe is here. Hi, Bobby. Morning. Good times, you guys. Good morning. Wow, we, I love that we have such worldwide reach. Um, even right here on on our screen, Gareth, you are where again? Uh, I'm in England, East Midlands. Excellent. And I am in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Coincidentally, the current home of our featured author in this week's What's the Score <laughs> Live. It's like, hmm, maybe I should just pop by. You know, it's just probably... <laughs> She probably frowns on that, but I'm a huge Karen Slaughter fan. So excited. All right, Utah, Philly checking in. Ugh. Oh, what? Sunny and hot in Whitstable. Uh, <laughs> and how's that possible? It's kind of yeah. overcast and a bit normal here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> nice. Oh, rainy Texas. Ontario is here. Oh, I look like great. We, I love seeing where everyone's joining from. Oh, Somebody out there from Johns Creek, and that's literally like three miles from where I am. I'm technically in Alpharetta, <laughs> so you know where I am. I'm in Nottingham, Harry. <laughs> 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 I love this. So we've uh, just hit 102, as you know, here with um, AutoCrypt. When we do our live streams, we like to give folks a couple of minutes after the top of the hour to make sure we get anyone in. Um, get everyone here and settled to take their virtual seats so they can uh, get pen, paper, keyboard, listening ears on, whatever is needed to get us started. So we'll kick it off. I am Beth with Autocrit here with Gareth today. And we have What's the Score Live. And this is a special treat this week because well, a few things. One, Gareth is here, and it's always fun when Gareth is here to kind of break down a book for us and walk us through all of the nuts and bolts behind the scenes of these best-selling or soon-to-be best-selling, as we'll see today, novels that um, align with all the reports that you get in Autocrit. So he can uh, put this book under the microscope and talk to you about the interesting bits and bobs that are revealed by our Autocrit reporting you can also do the same to your own work. So that'll be your call to action by the end of this afternoon's session. But we want to give a quick intro. Karen Slaughter, an amazing best-selling author. I think I just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, for those who are just joining us, that 
Karen Slaughter actually lives in Atlanta, which is uh, where basically where I am right now. And I know we have a few viewers out there in the Atlanta area. So um, great to have some local representation in Karen Slaughter. Now she is a very prolific writer. She has written um, 18 novels, a slew of short stories. Her novels have been translated into 37 languages and have sold over 35 million copies worldwide. And what we're going to look at today is The Silent Wife. Now, many of you Karen Slaughter fans are like, mm, I've not read that one. Well, guess what? It just came out in the UK. And Gareth, I believe it's coming out in the US in August. Is that correct? It seems to be. Now, we could be wrong, but just going by Amazon's details, it looks like it's August. I think it might be 4th, sometime oh. around then. But yeah, you, you US folks, uh, you're in for a bit of a sneak peek here more than usual. Yeah, so very exciting today on our What's the Score Live. And so without further ado, I, oh, one more thing about Karen Slaughter. How could I forget? This is my favorite part. I love her. Um, she just did recently um, appear on television's Holy Moly. Now, if you've never heard of this, it is like um, an obstacle course, like Wipeout, like American Ninja Warrior style meets mini golf. So there are windmills and they try to knock you over. So fantastic to see her being such a good sport on just a fun little mini golf obstacle course mashup show called Holy Moly. Not to spoil the surprise, but you may see her ride the uh, bucking Bronco version on Holy Moly is a giant bucking gopher, um, like how they had on Caddyshack, the gopher. So check her out on Holy Moly. <laughs> Be sure to pick up The Silent Wife when it um, when it comes out in the U.S. And we believe that's going to be early August. Um, now, do you know, Gareth, I, I know she's not self-published, but do you know who her publisher is offhand? Uh, I do not, unfortunately, offhand. I believe it is a uh, one of the big five, mm -hmm. but um, I couldn't tell you exactly which one. But yeah, she is a, a very high profile uh, mm -hmm. bestseller. She, she really is. So what we'll do then is hand it over to um, hand it over to you, Gareth. I'll let you take it away and I will work behind the scenes with the Autocrit team and we will find out who Karen Slaughter's uh, publishers are <laughs> and we'll come back and join. With that, I'm going to go ahead and maximize the screen and hand it over to you, Gareth. Okay. So um, if everybody can see my screen there, the you'll notice there's a lot of tabs along the top. Um, because these What's the Scores can be quite long and in-depth running all the reports, I've kind of preloaded uh, some interesting points to go through with you and, and just kind of be respectful of your time. So let's begin with The Silent Wife. Um, the first thing I'm sure we all want to know is what is the summary score? And that is 76.68. This is the general fiction comparisons. This is the very first score that we get just running the manuscript right on through. And some people, if I mean, if, you, if you've not been around Autocrit for a long time, you might think, well, for a best-selling author, that's really, really low. It's actually not um, in comparison to some of the stuff we've run before and, and that we've investigated. So it's not a shocking score. It's actually pretty good. Um, but let's see where we can go with it. The first thing I want to look at as a generally favor is dialogue and this is again an interesting thing for you autocrit users out there so if you do use the program follow along with me here running the adverbs or sorry the dialogue tags we know that the general rule really is to rely on using whoever said or whoever asked just he said she said she asked um, in your dialogue tags and avoid things like muttered murmured screamed and, and, and whatnot because there, there are better ways to get that across in the character action and the split here seems like huge uh the 665 others that really took me aback when i first looked at it um, but then it becomes quite evident what's going on here when you look at the most frequent dialogue tags that have been used so we have said coming in 578 followed by asked which is great and then some strange words so pointed looked, tried, uh, very, very quickly, you can see that these are not necessarily dialogue tags. Um, so explained could be one, yep, but shrugged, added, 
And there's a good reason for that, and it ties into the Autocrit AI. So let's see if I can find. So we go to React. Uh, try not to read too much if you're looking at the screen because this is a brand new book. You don't want to spoil it for yourself, but we can see <laughs> little things here, like bullet pointed. You know, this isn't what you showed me yesterday. He found the bullet pointed steps. So the AI is finding these verbs that are close enough to uh, quotation marks that they could be uh, actual dialogue tags. Now, going through the book, actually reading it, you realize, and you can even see it here in this little example that we can see, Karen Slaughter uses very, very few actual dialogue tags attached to the dialogue. This is the same kind of writing that we saw last time with Lee Child. Um, also, a what's the score just before that, which was Adam Neville, uses the same kind of thing. So rather than use dialogue tags, they simply follow or come in before dialogue with character action. So because that is still related to the same character, uh, like without breaking line or paragraph, you can still keep track of it perfectly fine. Um, and I think that's a great way to write. I really, really enjoy that. And it helps you cut down, if you, if you do approach it that way, it helps you cut down on a lot of the mistakes that you could make. So for example, if I had used one of these as a dialogue tag, you know, I, I would want to see that in the system, but I don't necessarily want them clogging up my, uh, my sidebar here. So if you tuned in last week with Beth and Kevin uh, to the customize your editing experience, what you can actually do in Autocrit, if you don't want to see this, is head into your settings and you can enter in the list of words to exclude. So you can just pop them in there. Now with an ex uh, exceptionally long list, I have to put them in one at a time, which is time consuming. So I'm not gonna do that here right now. <laughs> um, we're also, just to let you all know, we're working on ways that to make that faster. Uh, so you can actually get the words into the exclusions as quickly as possible uh, with all the updates that we're doing. There's tons of updates coming. So, you know, hold on to your hats for those, but they are coming. However, not to turn this into a cooking show or anything, but here's, <laughs> one, here's one I made earlier. So I went through and I excluded all those other words and brought us in with something closer to reality. And this is a much better looking pie chart. Yes. And when we come down to the words, we have said, used a, a lot of times, 578, but it's not in red, so it's not overused. Asked, we've got a bit of overuse there. Same with explained and uh, a little admitted, even though there's only eight in the manuscripts. So we could look through some of these. I'm not sure if I got them all uh, in the exclusions, but we have you know things like summarized, prompted. They're all very, very small removals, except for asked, which we have removed about 74. Um, if you were writing in the same kind of way that uh, Karen Slaughter does with, with the dialogue, I think going through and, and making those removals would not be too much of a task for you. Um, you would obviously have a, a handle on writing without tags, so that would make for an easy an easy fix. If you were wondering, and uh, looking at this, like how does that affect my score, since there's so many words that showed up previously, um, is that not going to mess things up for me? In fact, it, it doesn't really. Um, before the exclusions, we had a 76.68 summary score on general fiction. When we remove them, it goes to 77.33. It's less than a one point increase. And that's simply because of the lack of removals. You know, mm -hmm. the, the words are only detected once or twice for each one. So it's not a major problem. But uh, I think the main takeaway really from this is, you know, the very, very sparse use of dialogue tags, which is great. Um, I would for your next story or your next novel, try try that, you know, put that hat on and see what you can do. Ooh. And moving on from dialogue, adverbs in dialogue. So if you are not aware of what adverbs in dialogue are, they are adverbs attached to dialogue tags, like screamed loudly, um, you know, said hurriedly or something like that. And in another historic first, we have 1%. Wow. Wait, I think what? I think last time Lee Child had 0%, which was less than 1%, yeah. and this time 1%. As you could expect, you know, this is quietly, lightly, gently. This is um, basically just down to not using dialogue tags. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you oh, take out that whole other <laughs> potential problem. So yeah, uh, as far as I'm concerned, sort of going through, through this book and looking in the software, uh, sorry for the salty language in there the um 
dialogue is, is great. Not an issue for me st structurally at all. So top marks for Karen. Great. Now, after the dialogue, let me just check my notes here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show this, the our, our word frequency um, charts. So we have the most frequent words used are obviously the bigger ones, and then everything gets smaller uh, compared. And it's character names, almost exclusively character names, um, which is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you'd expect you would expect to see. Um, but I wanted to show the phrase frequency in comparison to, to to Lee Child that we did before. So, if you haven't yet watched it, watch it on YouTube. It's up there now. Um, but if you did tune in or or you have watched it already, you'll remember that Child's book uh, Blue Moon was really really packed full of dialogue. Uh, and he used a lot of dialogue tags. So the single most frequent phrase that was just huge in this cloud was Reacher said. So it's a Jack Reacher novel. So it just said Reacher said, um, and that was quite humorous. But compared to, to uh, Slaughter, hers are all pretty well um, spread out. There's not a lot that's really standing out above loads of other things. Uh, and you can probably tell what kind of book it is with like the woods and the killer <laughs> stuff wait, showing what? up. There. <laughs> now talk about a spoiler. Wait, what? The woods? You're like, this is yeah. a thriller. Fantastic. This is one of the best balanced word clouds in the phrase frequency report that I've seen. This is, it is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. It struck me um, just on just on first glance. You know, mm -hmm. the more you look at it, you notice that. Oh, yeah, there is a decent, a, a bit of a spread, but mm -hmm. uh, compared to some of the others that we've looked at, it's really, really. Um, it's, it's really, I don't know what to say, good. <laughs> <laughs> balanced, that was it, balanced. It's very balanced, exactly. And it just is such a contrast. It shows a really um, strong visual of the style comparison from Karen Slaughter to somebody like the Lee Childs book that we just did, where it's like, Reacher said, and hmm. that, that is the way his books really propel the action. Yeah, it's, it's one thing to keep in mind if you're doing your own books as well. You know, if you run the summary report and look at your frequencies and write, you know, just like uh, Lee Child, right in the middle, you have character said, um, and you didn't really think that your book was that dialogue heavy, then maybe that's something you want to go back and look at, you know, give you a new mm. perspective to, yeah. to approach it from. Yeah. Uh, moving on from this one, we are on to general use of adverbs. Always a favorite. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves adverbs. Yes. But if we pop in here, between good and great, really good result. The most frequent adverbs. Um, one thing again, just for you folks that aren't entirely familiar with Autocrypt, we have, you'll think that's a lot of red. Why is the result between good and great? Uh, the red just signifies that it's been overused, but it might only be once. So if your total number is huge for removals, you'll end up going right around the dial. But this is actually very, very good. So the most frequent adverbs are really, probably, already, and then we've got exactly and clearly coming in there. And let's see. So whenever you're looking through your book for these, you might look at, uh, you know, possibly, and be like, okay, how can I remove by eight of these? Now, looking, the ones that I would generally just kind of forget about or put to the back of my mind are the ones that are in dialogue. You know, the system will find them regardless of whether they're in dialogue or not. Um, however, one that I did notice that was in dialogue, just to contradict myself. <laughs> and this one here. So I'm not sure that's pronounced saute or saute. The coochie is in White County, approximately 50 miles from here. 29-year-old female named Alexander McAllister was found at the Unicoi State Park at approximately six yesterday morning. So we've got two uses of approximately. This is something that the repetition reports will also bring out for you. So, you know, it'll see that you've used the same word twice in quick succession. And that's something you would look out for. So perhaps this person is a police officer or something similar, and then they use this kind of formal language. But maybe your everyday person might use approximately the first time change it to something the second time and say, you know, at a round or at about six, but maybe they are entirely formal and mm -hmm. just using it that way. So this type of thing you could think about um, is just to look for those and see where those removals or, you know, remove them or switch them out. Or as we like to say, if you don't want to do anything about it, reject the suggestion, move on. It's, oh, yes, our you know, four R's, yes. 
awesome. it's your book and you you need to be happy about it uh and i guess you know Karen Slaughter is obviously happy about this. I'm sure she'll be very happy once it's on full worldwide release. <laughs> uh, so no criticisms of it whatsoever. Yeah. Um, merely and pointing out. Um, because we talked about this paragraph, especially as you mentioned, you know, the character is in law enforcement and, you know, having a, a, a lot of friends and family in law enforcement, I can attest to the fact that they do speak very differently than you or I would, <laughs> you know approximately this a 29 year old female blah blah blah. you know it, it is very distinctive so my my guess is that she did this quite on purpose to align with that more formal um speech pattern of someone in a law enforcement capacity so a, a great example of okay they're in dialogue tags but they're and they're two right next to each other who is your narrator here if it's law enforcement this is the way they speak and you want to stay true to your story then leave them just like you said yep. um Kind of, kind of being in control is where autocorrect really lets you take the action um, in the direction you need it to go. But if you didn't mean for that to be there, you know, do exactly. it and about six more in the morning, or about fifty miles instead of approximately. Yeah, cool. there, there are all sorts of reasons you might want to leave it from a creative standpoint. That's your choice, um, but we would rather that the system actually showed you things that you may miss than, mm -hmm. than ignore them completely by default. And they're, you know, what use would that be? If the, the whole benefit of having the quick highlighting and everything right there is that you can quickly, you know, zoom in on the things that your brain is just skipping over because you're so familiar with, with everything that you've written. Uh, and to take that away would just be useless to you. But <laughs> yeah. what, what you can do though, is like, you want to ignore that. It's like, I don't care about that. Just untick it. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not, not going to be there to bug you anymore right so oh, but overall yep the adverbs result uh, for the silent wife is very very good indeed excellent uh next i think it's always a gamble with these i've laid these out i'm blind, I'm blind <laughs> to them uh, unnecessary filler words so how do we end up for filler words mm. just above average um filler words um that's actually not too bad a result for a book because um filler words they, they, they creep in all the time um you can usually make some pretty good strides fast with with this report i think it's one of the you know the quickest ones if you're just going to sit you, you're like oh i've got two hours this evening to get some editing done on the manuscript filler words go for it um most frequent is that with 1752 like far and away that the most, is a lot. Uh, word. <laughs> hey <laughs> then we have a 404 page not fine for then <laughs> then just uh that's even and really but what i'm about to show you now will probably surprise you uh oh oh you may have seen it before i clicked that where's, my, that... where's my drum roll sound when i need it <laughs> <laughs> look at that the 1750 uses only eight wow that's that does like, surprise me it's actually the least of the recommended removals hmm the uh, main culprit is that's, which um, I think is is just not seen all that much because it's um, very informal, mm -hmm. um, tends to be very conversational. But m many books these days are conversational. I'll actually get to that later on and mention something about that. But uh, it's found within this book a lot either inside dialogue or when a chapter is being presented from the point of view of a certain character so there's a lot more contractions and things like that depending on the character it's uh karen bringing that character's voice into the passage which is perfectly fine um obviously i've not spent the entire time going through to look where i could potentially remove 119 ver uh, instances of that mm. but again it's what the system has detected uh, just compared to general fiction so we can uh, go through and check that out if you thought that was way too many for your own book again just click away and jump to the bits i'm not going to keep clicking and go through this whole <laughs> in, into the depths of this book for fear of spoiling something for oh for absolutely anyone. i need to look away i think <laughs> <laughs> close your eyes I can't read. Uh, next up showing versus telling indicators again we're just above average and again that's not actually a terrible result um for any manuscript you know including your own when you put it into the system um especially because showing versus telling is probably one of the reports within the system that is most fluid um these are indicators 
mm -hmm. all based on research, um, which is the presence of this word is an indicator that this section may be guilty of showing, or sorry, telling and not showing. It's not going to be a bullseye every time, uh, as with indicators. So words like could uh, can be, you know, wishy-washy. Uh, no, uh, he, he, you know, he could know that something is like, how could he know that? What, mm -hmm. what are you telling me here? Um, if we check out the results, so we, we got some decent ones here, like known, smelled, tasted, very, very small. So quick wins, uh, mm -hmm. like just removing one known out of 32, very quick win. But looking at the bigger numbers, we have 133 oh. for could. Uh, one thing that I've noticed here, and it should be in the printed version, the article of this as well, was an instance of something. I know it's nitpicking, but this section here where the, the card is kind of thinking, uh, you know, the professors could really screw with you if you wasted their time. This wasn't high school, things like that. Um, that is sort of by definition telling. It's mm. just, here's a thing that's going to happen. Um, it could be expanded upon with maybe an example of something that happened to somebody else that, you know, was made an example of oh. uh, some way to drive that home. But it's also not really an integral part of this passage. It's just a fleeting thought to the character as she's out for a run in the very beginning. So that kind of thing, you know, you would find that and you, you might get confused with yourself and think maybe I should rewrite that a bit and put a bit more detail into that but ultimately think about it uh, you know it's it's like kind of like descriptions nobody needs a 40 page description of you know every intricate piece of a setting so when it comes to thoughts and things like that for a character yes it's important to them in that moment but is it important to the actual chapter to the story to anything no well don't get hung up on it it's really um, a lot of the, the things we can say with AutoCrit when you're going through the uh, the recommendations is don't get hung up on it. Okay. Don't overthink. But um, yeah, it's actually a good result. Uh, looking through, I spent some time just jumping through and um, checking out some of these uh, for about the first half of the book. And I couldn't really find anything that I could pull out as a definite example and say, oh, I would definitely write that differently. Um, it's It's perfectly good. As you would expect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of description, generic descriptions. Mm. This is another one that can be quite odd. So again, we're just above average. That's a good result. And most frequent generic descriptions. So we have looked, look, good, maybe big. Mm. So these aren't overused. They're still in gray. We have low and main. Now, the thing with you'll quite commonly find words like looked and look um in the generic descriptions uh report because again these are indicators um you could say something looked like something or it looked big it looked scary you know how why did it look scary could, mm. is there some way to describe this better that you could do um one of the things we've got 181 so again from the top two look is only remove one mm. so from our database of of all across fiction uh, if, of a book this length you would likely only see one less look um, so that's either depending on how you approach it that's either a quick win just find a look swap it out if that works or go one i'm not going to bother with that mm. it's up to you um the biggest one looked 181. which do you do gareth when you see a number like you can remove one or you can chase the 181 which do uh, you do I go for the quick wins. <laughs> um, and I do exactly the opposite. I'm like, one, that because uh, in my theory, and I, I feel that it might be right, not that you're wrong, but the removing one, is that going to really move the needle on my entire manuscript? Or do I really want to dig into that 181? So I love that you go for that quick win and just pick them off. Yeah, I see. Is, and I am going the a complete opposite direction. It's all about whatever works for for the author, for you. Yep. To my mind, I'm going bottom up. You know, I climb the mountain, get the mm. little ones done, get to the top. And when you've done it, it takes it out of the red, dumps it down here in the bottom so you don't see oh, it anymore. Man. And then I, I work out it that way. It's clear out what I can and then hit the big ones. Boy. Well, I kind of love that approach because now I'm seeing that you'll get, when you say a quick win, it'll take it out of that red. 
and put it into that into either the gray or the purple at the bottom maybe i'll try it your way now i'll i'll make a deal i'll try it your way if you try it my way and jump i'll, in I'll, the, I'll give it a go i think it's know. it's purely a personal perspective thing i just like to have it <laughs> close, close away the red <laughs> So there's um, some things like this. You, you could see with Luke, so if we're trying to find some, he probably looked like a contortionist. That's fine. Mm. You know, of course. Uh, Fifth looked startled. I, I think that kind of works okay in that regard. There's some also where I think I found one where a character looked tired. Mm. Um, Sarah looked tired. Yeah. Um, you see, that's the kind of one where I would think, mm, uh, is, is that maybe... Again, telling and not showing. So some way we could, through her action, yeah, show that she's tired she and rub uh, her eye. She'd been processing. Yes. Yeah. So the way she talks to people, or the way she moves, or the facial expressions, or some kind of thing that's telling us that she's tired and sort of had enough. Mm. Um, is is potentially a better way to do it. But also, um, this is something that will come up later. You want to keep it snappy. Mm. So it may be perfectly fine. And again, this falls entirely into the choice of the author. We're just uh, bring it to your attention. Um, when you find the points, I think with, with a lot of these um, indicator words, when you are editing your own work and you, you click one and it finds something, it, it, it will literally do it enough times, it just clicks in your mind straight away. You, you know when you find something that you really ought to change. Mm -hmm. I love that we're, we're seeing comments, by the way, coming through in uh, our viewership for the live stream that we're doing, it's 50-50. <laughs> who's, who's with me on the start with the big ones first and, and who's with Gareth in getting those small ones first, getting those quick wins. So Well, that, that just means we're both right, so yeah, that's fine. I, I approve, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think the next report that I ran on this one is one of our favorites, yeah, the initial pronoun and names. Ooh, so, yeah, we just did this one um, uh, in a recent Deep Dive Live, so indeed. Well on everyone's mind. And we are not, this is not a comparative report, so it's not actually saying what's good and what's bad or uh, what you should change compared to what we know about other things. This one, we just have the data from the book. Um, if you are unsure, which uh, I, I know a lot of people are when we do these things, uh, how much of your book should have sentences starting with uh, a, a character name or a pronoun, Go back through the What's the Score series. Check out the, the blog. Mm. Um, this is only the second video version we've done of these, um, live anyway. So if you check out the blog, there's a whole load more. And you can go through the results and see. Um, we, we generally find in the past that you wouldn't tend to see above 50%. Uh, 50 to 52 would have topped it out. But uh, The Silent Wife comes in at 58.53. Mm. So certainly... You know, changing our expectations there, and nice. it's a, a surprise is always welcome. Um, and that bumped that up. So, the reason you might want to avoid this anyway, is, as as the deep dive live went over, is mainly just for reasons of repetition. You don't want to have he did this, he did that, she, she did this, he did that, just back and forth for sentence upon sentence that would it would drive you nuts. But um, fifty, it seems to still hold it together, and I think. Looking at something like this passage, um, there's there's quite a lot. Um, I think my screen might have shifted, but we have uh, see she Becky her. There's lots of yeah, like here. So Kelly Becky she her her she. There again she Becky Becky. So Karen Slaughter does it quite a lot, but she mixes it up. So she tends to break. Um, she won't ramble on for like four or five sentences with a, with a with a pronoun. Instead, she'll split them up between with names. So she might go pronoun, name, pronoun, pronoun, name. And then in between those, she'll sprinkle in to stop it overwhelming the novel. So something to keep in mind. Um, at least now you know when you're running your own reports, if you're sitting around 58, um, hey, Karen Slaughter does it. Now, might that score also shift a little bit if she has like a, a large number of characters? So maybe a story or novel that just has one or two characters that are really there, um, you know, versus having 70 that are trying to interact with one another. Would that shift the score? That, it, yeah, it probably would. It, it would depend entirely on how it's written, mm. really, because, um, you know, a, a name is a name. 
to the software. So yeah. names are names. Um, if you have more characters to work with, then maybe you're mentioning more names, or maybe not, depending on how you write it. I don't think, uh, well, speaking of huge amounts of characters, um, <laughs> I, I don't have the data here, but Game of Thrones, uh, yeah. I don't think was this high. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe that's because George R. R. Martin kills everybody. He's too busy killing them all. Right. He doesn't. <laughs> How long could that possibly take? So yes, I. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> like by, by the end of the book, there's only two there's characters two and no there, more names. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, I think the next thing is pacing. Mm. Um, this is a really good result. Ooh. Just two point three four percent of paragraphs detected to have slow pacing. The um. I think the result for Lee Child's Blue Moon last time was around 6%, um, if I'm recalling correctly. So this is really, really good. And what you would expect from a, you know, a, a snappy mainstream serial killer thriller type deal. Um, it really is. The pacing result, in case people have questions about that, but how Autocrit looks for it, it's a, it's a combination of many things, like uh, your sentence length, complexity of sentences, which involves, you know, the number of syllables and uh, everything there. And it's, it's all, cr and also the what's above and below every block of text throughout the novel in comparison to uh, the chapter and the whole book. Uh, it, it's just technical wizardry that crunches it all together and, and comes out with what might be a slower paced paragraph than you intended to write for that section. If we look at our graph. Oh. You see, it's, it's really, really well laid out. Um, any of the red is where paragraphs have been detected to be a bit slower. And what you would generally look out for are these sort of blocks mm. or clusters. We have a big one at the beginning here. Um, and this, I thought, wasn't actually too bad. Um, of course, the, the system wants to draw your attention to these things, so you go in and look at them and go, is there something here I, I need to fix? It's not, there is something here I need to fix. Is there something I could make better? And this opening is certainly slower than the rest of the book. Um, it's it's a slower paced opening. It's a sort of scene setting for the whole uh, thriller. It it's it sets a sense of foreboding and dread um, just naturally. So it's it's exceptionally well done, um, but not the kind of slam bang, you know, open with an explosion type thing that you will generally hear. Um, given as advice for, for most stories, uh, which I, I don't think it works all that well if you're you know writing something like uh, this kind of high concept thriller or uh, horror, horror stories and things like that. You want to get your claws in a bit more uh, in the beginning. The other cluster that we have, um, it looks to me like this probably arrives around just before the climax, which I think is fine. I would go in and have a look at it if it were my book and see maybe I'm doing things uh, slowing down a little too much there, but I think it's a good approach to take. Uh, you know, before you hit that climax, you've got the all hope is lost, and then licking our wounds, and you, you draw it back slowly uh, to a bit more slow, and then just blast into the climax. Perfect way to do it. Yeah, I, it made me think when you said that the opening of this one was a little bit slower to build that sense of dread. It made me think of a, a recent What's the Score that we did um, where there was just a ton of telling at the beginning um, as opposed to showing. And it, it felt the same way to me. So I think that was Blue Moon, right? The, the uh, Yes, yeah, it was Blue Moon. Book. So it, it may include a lot of uh, telling instead of showing, but that doesn't mean that it's slow paced. It can, it can be both. And I found that to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. It can still, you know, be a, a fast-paced, good-moving paragraph, um, and still just do a lot of telling. So it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. <laughs> is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of combined, combining all the different reports, looking at the, <laughs> looking at everything from different angles. Uh, <laughs> we try to make it as easy as possible for you, but it is in a, you know, unnecessary pain of editing. Uh, yeah. Your book deserves it. That's all I'll say. It's true. Uh, moving on to the next thing, I think it's power words. It is the power word profile. Mm. Now, this is another interesting one because um, if you were on a previous live stream, I think it might have been the power words live stream itself, the deep dive live. Um, mm. If you've never seen that, check it out on YouTube. Um, I think it's also in the videos section here on the in, inside the uh, Facebook group. That's yes, it is. That's true. And we find from a bunch of books that we looked at that. The majority of them seem to have three dominant emotions. 
that they always seem to have a, th a combination of three. The Silent Wife comes in with a combination dominance of two. Uh, with fear and encouragement. Mm. So if you go back to that sort of sense of dread that uh, you can feel setting in just within that first chapter, definitely speaks to the, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of fear to be had in this, in this book. Um, and it's, it's a book that gets, can get quite nasty at times. Um, encouragement, obviously, are these, you know, seeking the truth. In, in fact, seeking a killer, seeking something, trying to put things right um, is a lot of the encouragement words. And then just kind of sitting around here at the side, there's uh, lust, anger, uh, energy, and the forbidden. So the encouragement and energetic kind of go together in that sense of this, you know, search for justice and, and uh, going after things. But so does lust. Um, I think some people get a bit confused about lust, seeing that show up quite a lot in their books. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, carnal desires. It's, uh, <laughs> it's also, you know, the, the desire for gold, riches, uh, mm -hmm. money, power, everything in there. Uh, you know, domination and all that that, might, that a serial killer might uh, might be after. So combine that with anger, and yeah, you've got uh, a book about some nasty people on your hands. So I think it's actually a pretty good uh, combination to say what what the book's about, having having read most of it. That and it's um, it brought to mind the um, Kathy Reich's what's the score that we had recently done on a conspiracy of bones, and hers is very heavily weighted toward fear. There is there is some encouragement there, but not as not nearly as much as Karen Slaughter. So it really kind of under, underscores for me what type of um, what type of writer they are because it's either hardcore fear or it's well-balanced fear and hope. And that's what you can expect from Karen yep. versus, versus yep. Kathy Wright. I think this, this report very much, I guess, highlights the importance of vocabulary. Um, mm -hmm. the words that you're using and the difference in vocabulary between between different authors. Uh, they might be writing the same kind of thing, but the words that you use generate a specific tone. Um, and two words that mean the same thing can have a very different reaction in the reader. Uh, so it's just cool to see this. <laughs> As a yeah. word nerd. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Word nerdery. <laughs> I mean, word nerds plus pie charts. Come on, that's who wouldn't? Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> now, the um, final thing I had I wanted to bring to attention, really, just for this, was readability. Mm. Um, this is a simple thing, but uh, we, we do get some questions about what readability is all about and what, what, what does it even matter and what are the scores supposed to be. Um, personally speaking, I, I tend to just pay real attention to the, the flesh reading ease. Um, if you've read some of the What's the Score articles, you'll notice this is the only part I cut out because I really just go by this uh, the majority of the time. And readability is, it's not perfect, but the Flash score is a an overview of how you, well, readability, easy your book is to read uh, and how accessible it is for most people. You generally don't tend to find a lot of today anyway, mass market bestsellers coming in below 70 uh, on the flesh reading e-score. So 70 and upwards is where you start getting into the, you know, simple English, uh, simple writing. You'll find in this particular book, um, sorry, I don't have the stats right up here, but they're in the written article, which you can check out on the blog. The Karen Slaughter writes very snappy, you know, it's short sentences, short paragraphs, very, very few sentences getting uh, into the complex nature of uh, multi-syllable words and run on and commas or, you know, heaven forbid, semicolons. Oh, I love a semicolon. You take that back right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so read, readability um, is all about that. It's like um, some, some people think, well, my, my book's for adults. Um, it's okay if it's complex, a complex read, especially if it's like sci-fi and there's lots of terminology and mm. things like that. That's not really relevant. Um, the easiest ways to make your readability score increase and, and actually become more accessible to more people is simple, short sentences, um, snappier words, you know, cut down on the syllables. Um, and that's really the two major things you can do. Um, yeah. keep, it, keep it sweet. Um, and the more people that can read it, the more people will buy it. 
Exactly. So <laughs> exactly. It exactly. Kind of goes in the in the name of mass market paperback. It, Absolutely. That's what you want. People buying the book, and that doesn't get in. That doesn't have to get in the way of your sci-fi terminology and your, uh, you know, flux capacitors and whatever names you make up for uh, engines, starship engines, and things like that. <laughs> it doesn't have to lord over you. But um, uh, a score of eighty. How many parsecs it takes to make the Kessel run? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> a, a score um, a score of 80 there for that brings it in at uh, e uh, easy to read i yeah, think that's um conversational english and her her short sentences and the the straightforward language that she uses you know the in the flush scale in the flush scale an 80 is right between like easy to read and fairly easy to read but it's still very conversational which makes it very relatable when you know traditional consumers in a mass market world are looking at this book you know they're going to to understand it they're going to relate to it it's going to be very conversational so it's going to probably flow very quickly as they're reading through it um in in terms of going higher than that you know getting all the way up into the 60 to or to 70 range is still plain english but uh, you know below as you go lower number it gets more complicated so 50 30 10 there is a terrific uh, grid on Wikipedia for the Flesh Kincaid readability tests that just breaks this down for you in such great detail um, to see how your score stacks up to, you know, grade levels and that readability level. It's just really, really helpful. Yeah, the, the Wikipedia chart is, is great. Yes, um, just have helpful. a look at that. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing to say, as I said, the easiest way to break it to start getting it up is, is simply split sentences. So if you find that you're reading a sentence and it's going on with lots of commas and it's starting to get really, really long, just look where you can break it up. Um, drop it, drop a, a, I was going to say full stop, drop a period in and then uh, make another sentence, just reword it slightly. And a good way to find out if you're doing that as well in here is like, if I thought this was too long, um, if, you're a, if you're a pro user, get in there and have it read to you. Oh. <laughs> to, uh, one of our fantastic voices. And um, if you find the, I can't remember which one is the young boy, but it's really, really good. Um, um, I think it's Justin in the Justin. first column. Is that the, is that the test? Oh, I think that'll play in your um, headphones, yeah. not for us out loud. Oh, but uh, okay. It played in my headphones. It's so compelling. <laughs> but yeah, that was Justin. Um, so yeah, pick a sentence that you're worried about or a paragraph or whatever run the speech voice I, I do recommend justin it sounds really really natural mm -hmm. um and see if the if the computer seems to get caught up in trying to you know maintain breath even it, the the justin voice is sounds very breathy and with extensive sentences um you can almost in your mind something clicks and you just think from a human perspective nobody can breathe that long and uh there's points where you want to start breaking things up and increase your readability so with that said, I think we're about the end of this. There's a few more details in the printed version, so be sure to check out the blog for it. Yeah, but, so we don't give everything away here in What's the Score Live. <laughs> well, we also don't want to be here all night, so. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> I think I speak for everybody in that regard. <laughs> Absolutely. We love to actually read about um, these What's the Scores that Gareth is uh, so gracious enough to provide uh, whenever we release a new author, which is about every single month, then we take a selection from that author and really break it down to give you a good feel for that author's style, um, word selection, bar sentence variation, pacing. So you can see Karen Slaughter has been added to our platform as this month's new author. And her What's the Score is also up and available on our blog. And I've got a link for that. Um, right here, autoquit.com slash WTS. Now that'll take you directly to our blog already filtered to show you all of the what's the score contents. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, check out the full version of our Karen Slaughter what's the, what's the score, as well as the authors that we've previously dissected in what's the score. It's just fascinating to see things like the, the use of power words and how they vary, not just from genre to genre, but within a genre from author to author. It's just um, very interesting stuff and can really help model your writing and help fine tune your writing by 
making those suggestions and comparisons for you. So, yeah, and uh, I would say as well, you know, if there's any authors you want to see added, always feel free to shoot us an email, uh, leave a comment somewhere. We're just constantly building lists in the background here of what authors we could add to the platform. So, you know, as long as they've got a big enough uh, bibliography for us to crunch the data out of, um, all <laughs> suggestions are, are, are welcome. Yes, absolutely. And often we'll do polls, for example, uh, via email in our Facebook group to say, you know, we've got three or four authors in mind. Which ones would you like to see? So when you see that poll come across, uh, don't be afraid to vote and let us know. Or if you have a write-in, let us know. We do keep track of that. And as we start to acquire more and more content for our analysis and comparison, certainly important for us to have that feedback directly from our users. If you are not already a user of Autocrit, be sure to go and create your free forever account at autocrit.com. If you are a free forever user and you'd really love to take advantage of some of those professional level features that Gareth just mentioned, I believe the audio um, text to speech is a pro feature, correct? So we would definitely, um, want you to take advantage of this offer. If you missed it the first time as a free forever user, we will give you another chance. We're all about um, giving you another chance to sample that professional level subscription for 14 days for just $1. You can get that special offer at autocrit.com forward slash DDL for deep dive live. Oh, we're seeing some suggestions come in. Oh, Ooh. Yes. I missed I missed one thing, the uh, genre comparison. Oh, show us. I'm going to put your screen back in there. Okay. So I have just compared Karen Slaughter's The Silent Wife to the Karen Slaughter profile. It's <laughs> uh, jumped up to 81.42. So oh. that's a, a nice jump forward. Now, I'm going to take the banner down. Would you show us no, I believe switch? Oh, yes. Uh, let me just get to the right. So, many here. so whenever you're inside, up the top here, uh, you're by default general fiction. Uh, I believe if you're a free user, you have general fiction and also a couple of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, but with Pro, you unlock uh, a whole ton of fiction and nonfiction, both the overall genres and the authors. So I just popped in here and find uh, Karen Slaughter, who we just added. And uh, using that, we can then compare our text directly to hers, uh, get recommendations based on her writing style. Uh, and this book comes in at 81.42 match compared to all the data combined from her entire writing career. That is fantastic. And again, it's not a, again, not, a, not a low score. Some people may be a bit shocked at that because really, you know, no author writes the book, same book over and over and over again. Uh, that would be the only way to come out with uh, a 100. <laughs> So I think, uh, so hopefully Irene out there in our YouTube viewing audience right now, hopefully that answered your question, the um, compare your text. So that is how to select the genre to compare to. However, I should mention that that 81.42, that is with the um, exclusions in for the dialogue tags that sure. were detected. Without the dialogue tags, it's 80.77, uh, 80, 80 which I think you'll see in the printed, or the, I call it the printed version, but the, the, <laughs> the, the non-video, non-watching <laughs> video version. <laughs> That's fantastic. So once again, um, here is the link to grab your $1.14 day professional trial. Now, if you love Autocrit Professional as much as we do, um, go ahead and just become a regular subscriber. We often also send out some uh, really great promotions around uh, annual memberships or even a lifetime membership. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But just to give you a taste of Autocrit Professional for $1, it's autocrit.com forward slash DDL. Um, I'm not sure if that is case sensitive. To, so to be on the safe side, make that uh, DDL. <laughs> I don't want to steer anyone wrong. We'll also put this link in the comments for everyone. Um, so you'll have a chance to test out things like the um, the text readers and uh, some of the more specific genre and author comparisons. I would say if you, if you want to start making big strides, as soon as you have your, your pro trial unlocked, just jump, jump straight in with the unnecessary filler words. You, you'll, Ooh, really, you'll really feel it very quick. 
yeah, whether you like to start with the big numbers <laughs> or the small numbers. <laughs> yeah, and tell, and tell us which fun. side you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. So absolutely jump in there, have a blast um, and, you know, upload your latest manuscript and do your own mini what's the score um, dissection and continue on your editing journey. I think with that, Ooh, we might if you've see. lasted this long, yes, if you're, if you're, or if, if you're alive now or you're watching it on YouTube, um, do us a favor, just make sure to like the video, click the little sort of thumbs up below yes. and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So those send this kind of, you know, quote unquote social signals to YouTube that um, the content is good and everyone appreciates it. So yes. we really appreciate that. <laughs> like, subscribe. Um, join our community on Facebook. Absolutely. We are so glad you joined us today. Thanks so much. I hope you had as much fun as we did. And go and read The Silent Wife. Absolutely. When it comes out, if you're in the UK, you can get it now. <laughs> you can get it right lucky, now. Yeah. Lucky. And the rest of us will be on the edges of our seats until August when that comes out. You can still catch Karen Slaughter on a, on a review of uh, Holy Moly on, online, which is going to be fun. Thanks, everybody. Have a great time, and we will see you here next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye.